Carl Honkinen. I uh, joined the U.S. Forest Service Northeast Area State and Private Forestry Program in 2014 as a watershed forester. He's responsible for improving water quality and forestry operations in six New England states and also in New York. He provides uh, technical direction and leadership for best management practices on non-point source pollution control and also provides expertise in silviculture and natural resource management. Today he's going to provide an overview of forested riparian buffers, why they're important and how different agencies and organizations in the region are improving these critical ecosystems. So please uh, help me welcome Carl Hunton. Thanks, Dan. While he's getting that up and running, I'll do my little intro. Uh, thanks for having me here in the great state of Vermont. I come to you from the great state of Maine. So I made a little uh, comparison intro here. You guys have great maple syrup. We have, we have great lobster. You have camel thump. We have Katahdin, both lofty peaks. You have Lake Champlain not far from here. We have the Atlantic Ocean, wonderful water bodies. You have Sanders and Leahy, and we have Collins and King. Great people. Finally, and uh, I'm a big hockey fan, so I have to talk about this. Um, you have the Catamounts. Their record last year was 15, 22, and 3. Some work to be done there. The main black bears, 8, 24, and 6. So you got to speed on that one. Um, I'd like to start off with a, a, a two questions for the audience, and I start my talks with this often because I've heard it before. I apologize. How many days can you survive without food, give or take? Depends. It is after Thanksgiving, and you might have had extra pie from Nana's table. So about three weeks, give or take, you can live without food. How many days can you live without water? About three days. So food, water, that's kind of the gist of why we're here, folks. Water is an incredibly important resource and one that we really need to be careful on how we manage it. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. Briefly, uh, as an overview, I want to talk a bit about who the U.S. Forest Service State and Private Forestry is, a brief commercial on that. I want to talk about watershed buffers and riparian buffers and how they protect our water quality. And lastly, I'll finish with how we're doing this, um, some success stories from around the region and perhaps some, some thoughts about how we can expand this. How am I going to do this in 15 minutes? That's going to be a challenge. I'll do my best. Here in the Northeast area, there's a 20-state region that the Forest Service oversees with state and private forestry. So we're a little bit different than research. We're a little bit different than the national forest system that manages the green and the white mountain national forests. State and private forestry works with state agencies like, like Steve Sinclair and the Vermont folks that are here, as well as private organizations and private individuals. There's 172 million acres of forest land in this 20-state region. About 125 million people, or about 41%, of the U.S. population lives in this area, which is why we spend so much time here. And about 50 to perhaps 75 percent of the people that live in this region depend on a surface water supply for their drinking water, which is why the areas in green here are so important to protect water quality for everyone involved. And our number one mission is to keep forests as forests. And uh, I need some technical assistance. I didn't touch anything. You saw me. So if we can keep forests as forests, we are reaching our goal. I'm not sure why that happened. It wasn't always like this. Oh. Here we go here. There you go. It wasn't always like this. Um, <laughs> back at the turn of the century, we were cutting a lot of trees. We were clearing forests at a rate of about 13 square miles a day. And 
back around uh, the early part of the 19th century, we lost our forest lands east of the Mississippi. Started at about 70 percent forest. They went to about 20 percent forest. We were clearing forest at a rapid rate, chiefly for agricultural use, and uh, we found that it's troubling in many cases. And one of the most uh, visible ones and important ones that we saw here in the Forest Service is in the White Mountain National Forest. This area was uh, severely impacted by deforestation around the turn of the century, and we found eroding hillsides and streams beginning to fill with sediments. We found uh, mill owners that were popping up along our rivers to create textiles and other industries, that their rivers were either flooding or in drought stage, and the mill owners were finding it hard to manage flow to keep that water power running. We also found that uh, those guests from away that would come up and, and visit our grand hotels were dismayed at the looks of denuded hillsides and streams choked with sawdust and silt. And there was quite an uproar, and thus the Weeks Act was formed. Uh, Congressman Weeks from Massachusetts helped sponsor this act, which created the Forest Service and the National Forest System. And today, the White Mountain National Forest uh, manages about 780,000 acres, uh, give or take. So it's been quite a transformation from that period of deforestation. Here in Vermont, we've got about 75% uh, forest cover based on our forest inventory and analysis data. And we're here to help you manage that through our landscape scale restoration grants and many other programs. Every state has a five-year forest action plan, and those plans dictate objectives that the state wants to reach. If you have an idea that is consistent with an idea met, mentioned in the forest action plan, that's something that we can consider in our landscape scale restoration grants to fund. So I'd be happy to speak with you at some other point this morning about that. Another thing that's important for us in maintaining water quality is best management practices, or here in Vermont, you call them acceptable management practices. And these are things that help us protect stream and water quality from forest practices. So if we can help loggers with temporary skidder bridges over water crossings, we can help them develop skid trails and landings in appropriate locations to help minimize impacts to streams. That's a great thing for us to do. We're monitoring that on a random basis to see how effective those AMPs are. And the good news is approximately 80 or to 90 percent of watersheds are not being impacted by logging operations. And we want to keep that monitoring of, of uh, AMPs up to maintain vigilance there. A lot of that goes to loggers being trained and loggers having access to skidder bridges to help them bridge those stream crossings. All right, the commercial is over. Let's get into the science. So, Riparian forest buffers. These are the areas where the water meets the land. And I was trying to explain this to my son the other day on the phone. And he's like, what are you doing in Vermont, Dad? And I was like, think of a stream and think of the water quality in that stream. Would you rather drink a stream from a stream that had a parking lot next to it or a forest next to it? That's what a buffer is. And he says, okay, I get it. So the idea here is that water falls on the surface of the earth it's intercepted by the canopy of our forests or our, or our, our grasslands. It eventually drains the streams, the rivers, to the bay or to Lake Champlain or, or wherever. So forest land cover is critically important and thus riparian buffers are critically important to maintain that water quality. When that water hits the ground, about 45% of it is actually evapotranspired right back into the atmosphere. About 5%, give or take, might run off, but the vast majority of it is infiltrated into the ground. So our forests are those living sponges that help absorb water and slow water down. We hope that over time we can maintain forest cover, which is why I mentioned earlier that keeping forests as forests is our number one, is our number one priority. Make sure I don't miss anything here. So, why do we want forested riparian buffers? Well, these are areas that help imp uh, infiltrate pollutants from the surface into the surrounding water bodies. So, as the water runs down across this landscape, it's infiltrated and intercepted. 
Here in Vermont, the biggest issue that we're interested in is phosphorus. So we have a TMDL, or a total maximum daily load, or a pollution diet, if you will, of how much phosphorus we think Lake Champlain can absorb without having algae blooms. So a riparian forest buffer is an important structure to help us filter phosphorus, nitrogen, sediments, other nutrients from surface water before it reaches uh, a water body. In terms of, of the overall structure of them, let me go back one second. We hope that a, a buffer width of about 100 feet is ideal. If you have a 100 foot uh, forested buffer around a water body, you've got a great level of protection. Many USDA uh, programs to help support buffer implementation require a minimum of 35 feet for a cost share program, but 100 is even better. I talked about that one already. So these areas help us protect stream flow, they help us protect ecosystems, uh, they help us absorb floodwaters. Uh, the roots and structures of trees and the banks of our rivers and streams help slow down floodwaters uh, during periods of high, of high flow. They also create shade for aquatic species by shading that uh, riverine corridor and keeping water temperatures cool. One study that was done by Virginia Tech recently looked at how effective are grass strips that you see here in improving water quality. And they determined that uh, a minimum of a 30-foot grass strip would remove 84% of the sediment from agricultural operations from imp impacting the local waterway. Now, if you're, a, if you're a farmer driving a tractor trying to navigate on this landscape, you might say it's a bit of a challenge to keep your tractor going straight, but these are some of the trade-offs that we need to consider in maintaining good water quality. You may have to change some of your management techniques to keep those buffers in place and to perhaps remove a portion of your agricultural or forest crop in order to create that buffer. And this is where some of the rub is in, in creating forested buffers. You may be taking some land out of production for agriculture or for forestry in order to put that buffer in. But again, it's a trade-off that's a very important one for us to consider, and there are funding mechanisms in place to help us do that, which I'll talk about in a minute. What are some of the benefits to buffers? This particular slide, I'm looking at the, looking at nitrogen removal. It's not the big issue here in Vermont, I understand, but it, this will help you show that a wetland can remove approximately 20% of the nitrogen from within a uh, forested or grass buffer. A grass buffer can remove upwards of 40% of nitrogen, and a forested buffer, it's even better, removes perhaps upwards of 60% of the nitrogen impacts to a local water body. So one of the reasons why we love to see more buffers. Uh, the last part of my talk, I'll start with uh, a quote from Aristotle. I've got a friend who's recently retired lawyer, lawyer down in Boston. He's now teaching Greek, so he's taught me a lot about Aristotle during some of our, our hikes in the woods. And one of the quotes he gave me is, we are what we repeatedly do Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So if we want to get into the habit of protecting water quality, I think it's important for us to get into the habit of creating larger and more functioning riparian buffers to do that. So an example of how that might look in the field, on the before slide, you'll see an agricultural area that basically has nothing but soil and a, and a stream course running through it. And after this area has been planted, You'll see some tree tubes, you'll see some grassed areas, you'll see the ability to filter pollutants and sediments before they reach that water body uh, being effectively managed and maintained. At the bottom, perhaps an ultimate goal in some places, but maybe not all, is a fully functioning forested buffer along a uh, rural stream. Again, protecting water quality, protecting cold water fisheries habitat. If you get, if you have some eastern brook trout anglers in the room, you understand what I'm talking about. Getting that cold water uh, and getting that uh, those structures available for trout and other species to have some protection is critically important. It's not easy to do this. Um, 
who, who do we have that's out there that's available to go out and plant thousands of trees in a riparian area? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to pay for it? How do we teach people how important it is to get it done? These are some of the challenges that myself and many of my colleagues on riparian res restoration uh, wrestle with. I've got a couple of great examples that I'd like to show you from New York. This one comes from uh, the State University of New York in, in Oneonta, where they've planted about 700 trees in and around Oaks Creek, uh, covering a two-acre parcel of land. It's a former agricultural plot that's no longer in production. And this army of student volunteers worked diligently throughout 2016 to plant uh, these, these uh, trees, to put up tree tubes to eliminate uh, or minimize predation by deer and meadow voles and other creatures. And the end result is a uh, soon to be effective buffer, which you'll see the, the tree tubes along the stream in the, on the right middle of the, of the slide. And this will need to be maintained over time. Another example, uh, again, from our neighbors in New York is their Trees for Cribs program. This is one where the state of New York, over the past uh, 10 or 15 years, has serviced over 60,000 uh, different locations with uh, different uh, planting materials across the state of New York. They've got volunteers in place that are able to receive low cost, or in some cases, no cost plant materials to revegetate. Uh, tributaries to the major streams such as the, the Susquehanna, which is the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay uh, that you see here uh, here in green. They've also got an active program on uh, the Lake Champlain uh, shoreline to our west. A favorite of mine is, is this one. I don't know how many people love to cut grass in this room. I'm not one of them. I don't, I don't get into that at all. Uh-oh. Which one is it? I wonder. It's that. Okay. I just wiggled these wires over here. So nobody likes to cut grass. Or at least I don't. So how can we revegetate some of these suburban lawns to to a functioning riparian buffer? We're looking at places where we have willing residents, willing homeowners to stop mowing and start planting. How do we pay for this? Well. There are programs in place through USDA, the Farm Service Agency, and NRCS called the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. This is an incentive program for landowners where they receive uh, cost share funding to install and to maintain buffers on an annual basis. And uh, it's often hard for us to get to these people to encourage them to join in, but once we get them in place, they've been very effective. In the long term, Monitoring, mowing, herbicides, and fencing are often needed for us to adequately maintain uh, riparian buffers. It's not uh, planted and forget it type of uh, landscape. They need to be monitored over time. Uh, one example I'll give is in New York, where we planted a whole five-acre parcel in, in Buffalo along the Niagara River, and it was like we we rang the dinner bell. The next day, the deer came in and just mowed down everything. So it's important to have tree protection and to have fencing in place in certain areas to help protect these young species before they uh, before they get munched on. There's a lot of partners involved in this effort, from the Forest Service, from the Farm Services Agency, from state agencies, and from from NRCS, etc. That can help us do that. Why is the first guy always get the glitches? There we go. That's it. That's all right. I could finish with that. Exactly. <laughs> this is my last slide. Um, this is the goal. If we can create uh, a mix of, of uses of forestry and agriculture and an adequate buffer around our riparian zones, I think we'll do a lot to preserve water quality. So let's all work together to help uh, reach that goal. Here's my contact information. I'll be here most of the day today. I look forward to, to hearing uh, any questions you might have, and thanks again for your time.
got one. Um, so yeah, I wonder if um, there are uh, any unmet research or monitoring that you're doing. It seems like there's a vast body of knowledge already. We understand many of the benefits. Are there some areas where you're still looking for information in the research community? Great point. I think the biggest void in research, and I touched upon this, it's the impact of phosphorus and how, how effective are buffers at removing phosphorus. We know that phosphorus is adhered to sediment and sediments are rapidly intercepted by buffers, but there's not a lot of good science out there in, in how exactly phosphorus moves through a buffer and how effective it is. So if uh, there's some chemists out there and some forces out there that can help bring those ideas together, I think that would be a, a great uh, synthesis that's needed. All right, we'll have more. Oh, there's one more. Yeah, knotweed is a, is a huge issue um, along with other invasives. And as I touched upon, it's a very diligent recipe of restoration that needs to be in place. It's, it's that, in some cases, mowing. In some cases, it's an herbicide treatment that's needed to allow those plant materials to get up above the point where invasives would impact them. And it's, it's an ongoing struggle. Not everybody is a big fan of using herbicides, and thus a mechanical means is often required. And with, your, with a shallow soil system and with a reluctance to, uh, to use uh, a chemical means, it's a mechanical means and it's very labor intensive. And that's a real difficult challenge. All right, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.